This is the New American Media. Live from the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system planet Earth. What was that third rock from the sun? North America, the United States of America, California, Los Angeles to be specific. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Unhappy Hour here on the NewAmericanMedia.com. My name is Brian Engelman, and I'm going to be your host. And what are we doing today? What are we doing today? What are we doing today? We're going to be talking about sports. Yes, it's going to be a nice little change of pace from a lot of the stuff that we normally talk about here on the NewAmericanMedia.com. Of course, we split it up into two different sections. One section is called the Unhappy Hour, and it's sports. Because, ah, it's such a nice little distraction. Nice little soap opera to watch. And, of course, we have another show called Agree to Disagree. Our special guest coming up at 5 p.m. Pacific is going to be Dr. Catherine Albrecht. Talking about the NSA and spy chips and smart meters and... Edward Snowden and all of these other fantastic things and where we lose our civil liberties where the Fourth Amendment is thrown out the window in the guise to protect us and keep us safe. We no longer have any privacy according to some people, but the uh, Constitution says differently, but that's coming up later. For now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk Strictly Browns. It's a segment that we have not really had the opportunity to delve into very much, but last week Brandon O'Dell graced us with his presence and we went through a synopsis, an overview of the Cleveland Browns offense. What we're going to do today is Cleveland Browns defense. Do us a favor, you can check out the archive shows in several places. Our homepage, thenewamericanmedia.com, click on sports. It's archived right there. You can also go and subscribe. Please click subscribe, youtube.com slash thenewamericanmedia. It is archived over there. Leave your comments, share it with your friends. Definitely join the conversation. Let's talk some Cleveland Browns. And then, of course, our Facebook, search The New American Media. Put spaces in it, I think. Yeah, whatever. The New American Media. Like our page. And on Twitter, we're at American underscore media underscore. So without further ado, let's get Brandon into the program, shall we? Talk some Browns. Good morning, Brandon. You're live on the air. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? Living the dream, of course. Uh, we were talking briefly off air before we got going. Just real quick, as we introduce you to everybody, we're talking Strictly Browns. You had a bit of a little announcement. Uh, you're going to go on a reconnaissance mission to see what they're up to over over with at, at Brownies Central. I guess you're not going to Berea. You're going to the real deal down by the lake, but I figured you might want to tell people about that. Um, yes, I'm uh, going to get to go on a behind-the-scenes tour of First Energy Stadium and uh, will actually get to uh, walk around through the team's facilities, uh, see the locker rooms, uh, actually get to walk out onto the field, uh, maybe even be able to play uh, catch with my pops uh, on the Browns football field. And, and that's always something that, uh, that I would say would fall under the pretty cool category. So you're going to be playing catch with a Frisbee, obviously, which is what makes sense. Yes, you know, ultimate Frisbee, so it's more like football, at least. <laughs> I figured either lacrosse or Frisbee playing catch. No, that is very cool. I hope you have fun, and like I said, if you got a couple of pictures, send them over this way. We'll put them out on our Twitter and Facebook feed, let people check it out. Uh, maybe we'll even use one of those photos for your fake uh, Twitter profile that we're eventually going to create for you. But anyway, getting back to what we brought you in for today, we're talking about the Browns, specifically the roster, all the shakeups, the things that have been going on. Last week we talked, of course, about the offense, all the, you know, the sexy positions. Not for me. I played defense. I, I like I like the defensive side. Um, but l let's get into the defense today because, once again, it's kind of a cleaning of house with the coaching staff and, you know, some players that – Joe Hayden started off suspended last year. We brought in some free agent acquisitions, some rookies coming in. Let's just kind of take it from the top. Where, where do you want to start with coaches, maybe? And then we'll get into the players. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess we could talk about uh, the defensive coaches uh, because uh, we definitely uh, – we did, did we talk about the uh, about Ray Horton last you week? You know, I don't, uh, I, don't think, I don't think we really got into Horton. I mean, we were talking about Norv Turner. We were talking about Chud. Re real quick, though, I, I – a tangential because I took this note down. How do you feel about it being called First Energy Stadium compared to Cleveland Browns Stadium? Does it make a difference to you at all, one way or another? Um, this is what I'll say. I had a lot 
I had a lot harder of a of a time switching from Jacobs Field to Progressive Field than I think uh, I will have uh, with the Cleveland Browns Stadium to First Energy Stadium. And the reason why is because Jacobs Field is is not a factory of sadness, or at least at one <laughs> factory of sadness. I mean, uh, you and I both can say that that we've seen some some pretty rocking games uh, at the Jake back in our uh, more formative years. You know, that was a that was a fun place to be, and uh, you know, calling it Progressive Field. Uh, you know, Cleveland Brown Stadium. I have some great memories. But for the most part, most of the memories are more about uh, the friends that you were with than the game. Right, right. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But um, there have been very few landmark uh, games uh, at Cleveland Brown Stadium. No, you have Bottle Gate. You have Bottle Gate where they threw the, 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 the plastic bottle. What was that, against Jacksonville? And then you had the – no, no, but, but, you know, you bring something up. This is a minute – 11 seconds long. I just want to let people know in case they're not familiar, Factory of Sadness. Uh, changing Cleveland Browns Stadium away, you're changing away the Factory of Sadness, hopefully. This is Cleveland Thundercat on YouTube. This is Mike Polk Jr., Cleveland Comedian. Just to play for everybody, it's about a minute long. Hey, Browns! Mike Polk, season ticket holder. Killer game in Houston today. Well, thank God we built you. What a blessing for the community. You are wasting valuable space on our majestic shoreline, and what do we get out of it from you? Ten miserable games a year, including two preseason games that I have to pay for, and one shitty Kenny Chesney concert. Do you understand that it is actually statistically harder for a team to be this consistently bad than it is for them to occasionally accidentally be good? The probability is staggering. Did you happen to see that Packers Chargers game today? It's like they're playing a different sport than you are. And here's what you have to understand. We don't even expect you to be good. We just want you to be watchable. Do you have any idea how low our expectations are? We don't expect you to win the Super Bowl. We just want you to look better than a Division III high school team. And listen, I know that there are way more important things in life than football, but you are supposed to be our pleasant distraction from those things. But all we do is pay you money to put us in a bad mood every week. You are a factory of sadness! I'll see you Sunday. And there you have it, Mike Polk Jr. And he's wearing a Ryan Pompreon jersey, <laughs> if you recall the long snapper that was drafted, yeah. a specialty player. Anyway, but yeah, the factory of sadness. I, I like what you're saying there. It's been a lousy, what, decade and a half since they've been back. A whole lot of, what, is it only a decade? What, what year did they come back, Brandon? Uh, 99, I believe. So, so uh, good, 13, is, uh, 14 years? Okay, almost a decade and a half. But, yeah, I mean, I don't, okay, good point. I, I still can't call it progressive I, I can't call the Jake progressive. I just It doesn't work for me. Cleveland Browns Stadium, adios, hello, First Energy Stadium. We'll just see if Jimmy Haslam's around to still be the owner when he gets out of his legal troubles. But anyway, let's move on from that and get into it. Talk about Ray Horton a little bit because uh, some people were saying last year that, that the Browns defensive coordinator wasn't the – you know, you, you hear it every year, but they really cleaned house and they're bringing in Ray Horton. Let's just start with him at the top and uh, talk about him for a little bit and the impact he's going to have on the new defense. Uh, well, Ray Horton's uh, claim to fame uh, is that uh, he is uh, schooled under the Dick LeBeau, Pittsburgh Steelers attacking style defense. Um, he uh, played under Dick LeBeau uh, in Cincinnati, I believe, uh, uh, a, a long time ago, and, uh, and then uh, ended up uh, coaching uh, with him and was uh, given an opportunity to be a defensive coordinator in Arizona two years ago and, um, you know, definitely uh, has uh, kind of a, um, uh, a he, he stands out, uh, we'll just say that. Uh, he uh, had uh, long dreadlocks, which uh, was something that was, you know, maybe a little bit less common, especially for an NFL head coach something you might or an, an NFL assistant coach I should say uh, he actually just uh, cut them recently uh, uh, you almost wonder if uh, if he isn't doing that to you know really show that that he himself is uh, turning the page and focused uh, on you know this team and this team alone and uh, you know I don't know he's uh, he's 
uh, an interesting guy to listen to. I don't know how much uh, you've uh, heard him talk, but he's uh, highly intelligent, uh, really knows what he's talking about, just just a very interesting guy to talk to. Well, I'm looking forward yeah. to getting some more of that. I, I don't get the local coverage like I used to. Um, yeah, I, okay, it's on my radar now. It's official. It's on my radar to see what's going on there. And and so are we to expect, because I was reading a recent article on the on the Plain Dealer, um, plaindealer.com or cleveland.com, whatever the heck it is these days, but um, th- there were some recent comments about wanting to be a total defense, not just a, a blitz defense. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Have you, do you know the article I'm referencing? Because pe- people are kind of suggesting it's just going to be a – uh, you know, throw caution to the wind, blitz on every play, kind of a lot of glory and sacks for the linebackers, but maybe not a very good overall defense. Um, have you been hearing similar questions about what kind of style they're actually going to play in Cleveland? I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. It would be completely ludicrous. You would never be able to win a game if you were just, uh, you know, blitzing constantly because uh, the quarterback would just uh, basically put – one more person uh, out there to catch a pass than you can block the, the, than you can cover and uh, so I mean there has to be uh, a a happy medium there um, but but I think the main thing is just that uh, this is you know so many people in the Cleveland uh, media are throwing around the words uh, attacking style defense. Uh, whereas uh, last year or last two years, the defense has been more reactive rather than proactive. Um, I, the, the hope is that uh, some of the uh, defensive backs uh, will be able to cover their guys man-to-man more than they had to do last year where they played a little bit more zone. Um, and uh, if if it can all come together, uh, this this team definitely has some some real quality and some real depth uh, in the front seven that that uh, Ray Horton can do a lot of fun things with. Well, why don't we start right in the middle with the big guy, Phil Taylor? He he sat out practice on Thursday, a calf strain that he's that he that he, he's had since last week. Uh, big boy, three years in out of Baylor, former first round pick. Uh, let, let, let's start with the big boy in the middle because in a three four, it, it kind of changes the dynamic of what that down lineman is going to mean. Uh, talk about Phil Taylor. Uh, well, the the hope is that Phil Taylor can be a uh, Casey Hampton or uh, Haloti. Not well, you know, Casey Hampton. Uh, on you know is uh, would be good. Uh, Haloti Nada would be even better. Uh, but that type of um, of you know inside defensive presence uh, at tackle. Um, you think about uh, the. Uh, the the player for uh, Cincinnati that is uh, Carlos or uh, or Geno Atkins uh, is uh, thought of as being one of the best defensive tackles in football. So uh, each of the other three teams in our conference uh, has this premier defensive tackle that uh, that everyone fears uh, having to line up against. And uh, our hope is that Phil Taylor can continue to progress into ours by staying healthy and uh, and being a, a real uh, run stopping and uh, and uh, you know really collapsing the pocket type of force. Well, he's shown he's shown flashes of that that brilliance. He, he's shown flashes of it, and you know he's not the only big boy on the roster though. Bef- I mean, before we move move around too much, I mean there are some other big boys on on the roster. I'm not sure how we want to do this. If we want to talk about kitchen first or Billy Wynn or some of the other guys, or if you just want to go to the ends, uh, take it whichever direction you want to be. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about the, uh, the players that will be contributing most uh, to the defensive line. And then we can just briefly mention some of the backups. Uh, when you're talking about, uh, the, uh, other starters, uh, in a three, four defense, you have three defensive linemen, and so uh, your first starter is Phil Taylor in the middle, and then you'll have two players at end uh, in Ataba Rubin and Desmond Bryant. Uh, first, Ataba Rubin uh, had a little bit of a down year last year, uh, was really looked upon as being a uh, an up-and-coming defensive lineman. I think he's going into about his sixth uh, season now. Uh, really probably 
looking to just be a little bit more dominant, had some injury issues. Uh, he's fully healthy uh, and, you know, maybe even healthier than Phil Taylor is. Obviously, you said Phil Taylor had to sit out practice the other day, so we'll keep an eye on that situation. Um, on the other side, another uh, guy who's uh, been dealing with some at least minor injuries uh, through camp, I think he's been practicing the last couple of days, uh, Des Bryant, uh, our Des Bryant, uh, Desmond Bryant that we just got in uh, a free agent acquisition from Oakland, uh, was really looked upon as being probably our strongest uh, free agent signing altogether, uh, which is uh, strange because I hadn't really heard of him all that much uh, before uh, the Browns signed him. Uh, but he is uh, really basically meant to be another um, high-pressure, intensity guy who can really get to the quarterback and make plays. So uh, the defensive starters uh, are looking pretty solid. And when you think about the uh, backups uh, at D-line, uh, the main thing that uh, Coach Ray Horton is going to want to do is to be able to uh, continuously rotate guys because when you can keep guys that fresh uh, on defense, especially the uh, the front seven, uh, you're really going to be able to uh, put some some real heat on the quarterback. Well, exactly. You got Billy Wynn. Uh, how do you say Kitchen? How do you say that guy's first name? Ish. Ish. Ish Molly, I think. Yeah. Along. Ish Kitchen. John Hughes. Quentin, well, that now we're going to linebackers. Billy Wynn, Brian Sanford, whatnot. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, we know that that Billy Wynn got a little bit of playing time last year. That's the reason I kind of brought him up. Uh, you know, I, I guess obviously in a four three, it's different than a three four. But yeah, I mean, it's it's better to have some fresh legs. I mean, and, and you always just have to kind of prepare for someone to get injured. You never want to see it. You look around the league. I mean, what Stevie Johnson just got injured today. I mean, a lot of good players are going down early in training camp without games even being played. So, you know, the the depth of that defensive line is going to be very important. And let's hope Desmond Bryant can stay out of trouble uh, with his infamous mugshot. He's a Harvard grad. You'd think he'd know a little bit better, but we'll see. Everybody makes mistakes, but let's talk about who's who's primarily going to benefit from this in in terms of the linebackers because when the defensive line does their job right those linebackers can fly so uh, uh, do you start with Dequell Jackson probably as the leader of that team is is who is all right who is the leader of the Browns defense is it Hayden is it Jack uh, it's got to be Jackson oh, it, right it's absolutely uh, Dequell Jackson uh, Dequell Jackson basically uh, is uh, is to this Browns defense what uh, you know Ray Lewis was to the Ravens. You know he's that uh, that vocal leader uh, who is the elder statesman in the locker room. And obviously Ray Lewis had been a you know had been around uh, a, a quite a bit longer than than uh, Dequell Jackson. But the fact of the matter is is that he's a respected leader who has produced on the field. He's gone through injury issues in the past. I mean, remember, I mean, he's uh, been healthy for about the last two years now, but he missed almost two full seasons right. prior to that or whatever. And um, so he's really just uh, truly uh, put together a string of a couple of uh, really solid seasons. Uh, and, you know, any team, uh, Dequel Jackson would be starting an inside linebacker for uh, 32 out of 32 teams in the NFL. Uh, so, um, I mean, he's a, he's an excellent player, very well respected. Uh, if you talk about uh, on the other uh, inside linebacker spot, uh, Craig Robertson uh, is a name that uh, is still a little bit uh, under the radar, a little bit new to Browns fans. Uh, but Craig Robertson, an undrafted free agent uh, in 2012 out of uh, North Texas University, if you remember, that's actually where uh, I believe it was uh, Sean Thompson. Uh, remember the Brown second ah, round yes, draft yes, yes. Uh, went to school, um, and uh, so. Uh, but Craig Robertson, uh, uh, an undrafted guy, basically made it on effort uh, in uh, training camp last year uh, and ended up uh, playing some pretty good uh, football in a reserve role for the Browns last year, finished second on the team in tackles. Uh, and he, if you remember, uh, uh, was one of those linebackers along with LJ Fort who intercepted 
Mike Vick on that uh, opening day game last year. It was like four, four four interceptions up. on that game. Yeah, it was uh, even more than that. It was uh, six or something Ugh, like that. I mean, a lot, yeah. It was way more than we should have had and still lost the game, that's for sure. But uh, that's another story. Uh, but uh, anyway, Craig Robertson uh, made some plays last year, and uh, Ray Horton uh, calls him his ace in the hole uh, and uh, basically is saying that there are a lot of good things that uh, that people are going to find out about this guy this year if he can stay healthy just like anybody else. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you're saying L.J. Fort is the ace in the hole or Robertson? I, I think I lost uh, you. Robertson, Robertson. Oh, okay. L.J. Fort's uh, a guy who uh, will, uh, you know, be kind of coming off the bench and, and mostly will make his mark on special teams. Okay. Uh, so one injury uh, happens and, and things change. And you also have James Michael Johnson uh, in the middle as well. He was a draftee last year that a lot of people really thought was going to be the uh, the, the next star linebacker. And uh, at least so far, it looks like Craig Robertson is ahead of him on the depth chart. Now, uh, as far as the outside linebackers go, uh, this is an interesting uh, issue. You have uh, really uh, three true starters um, because of the fact that uh, you have first-round draft pick Barkevius Mingo, you have second-round draft pick from a few years ago, and really probably the best uh, uh, pass rusher on the team all, all together in Jabal Sheard. And then you have the team's new, newest acquisition uh, from the Baltimore Ravens, uh, Paul Kruger. Uh, and so you have three guys who hopefully can really get to the quarterback and uh, really cause some disruption, especially if those defensive linemen up front are, are, are tying up the linemen like they hopefully should be able to. Yeah, I, it's weird seeing that Jabal Sheard's going to come off the bench there. Third year in out of pit. But that's the thing is I don't think he will. Everything that uh, they're saying in in Cleveland right now is that Jabal Sheard actually is uh, is very much out uh, outshining uh, what everyone's expectations were going to be, and is uh, playing far far better uh, than uh, people thought he would. Trying to make the switch from defensive end to outside linebacker and. Uh, Supposedly, so far, the transition has been quite smooth. Well, so where and do you put him, then? You're not going to put Kruger on the bench. You're not going to put your number one draft pick on the bench. That's the thing, that they believe that Mingo is going to be coming off the bench uh, in this first season for him. Uh, uh, hmm. And he'll be, he'll be doing something similar to what uh, the San Francisco 49ers did with uh, one of their star pass rushers, or I should say their star pass rusher, Alden Smith. And uh, supposedly Mingo is built about the same as Smith uh, in that he's a little bit thinner. If you see him, uh, in the footage of him in practice versus the offensive line, that he looks very thin. I mean, he looks like he's a tight end uh, or even a big wide receiver. He's, out there. he's 6'4", 240. So. 233. 233. And uh, so he's, uh, he's definitely, I mean, he doesn't look – uh, quite like what you would think of as a prototypical 3-4 outside linebacker. Um, but, uh, you know, they're going to give him a chance uh, to uh, get some big-time uh, uh, playing time because of the fact he's a first-round draft pick. He's a high first-round draft pick. So even if he's coming off the bench, uh, don't worry about the fact that, uh, you know, he's not getting any playing time because uh, – they're going to make sure that they get their money's worth out of Barkevius Mingo. Well, and if they're going to be blitzing a bunch, you know, you you bring him off the bench, he'll he'll, he'll play third downs to put the pressure on. So what? Exactly. You know, anytime, uh, you know, being in there, and you know, you could, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes uh, you could have uh, Mingo coming in uh, from outside linebacker and move your ball sheared up on the defensive line. You know, I mean, if there's anyone that's used to being in a, a down lineman kind of stance and cheered and so imagine having all three of them rushing the quarterback at the same time I know and maybe put put two defensive ends side by side and let them let them tango and twist and do different stunt moves man I oh. it, it, just thinking about how would you say linebacker was cause I, I'm trying to ask if linebacker was our biggest weakness on defense last year it's, it's kind of a loaded question because there, there were several problems but I mean, you, you, you trade it out with, with Mingo, with Kruger, and then you keep Jackson and Robertson stepped up and sheared there as well, and you're like, 
those are some solid linebackers, you would think. I think linebacker has been the biggest improvement uh, on the team uh, in the off season, and I think that uh, they're definitely, uh, you know, in really good shape at outside linebacker right now. You also have uh, Quentin Groves, uh, who was a guy that uh, Ray Horton liked in it when he was uh, coaching in Arizona and uh, followed his coach here. Uh, he, he'll be uh, a key reserve, and um, you know, um, I. I think that's uh, I think that's really pretty much about it as far as the uh, as far as the linebackers go. All right. Well, let, let's let's go to let's go to corner. The guy that was suspended to start the season last year, looking for a fresh start. Mr. Joe Hayden is he going to step up and become one of the elites? Has he already been there, or does he have it in him? How do you answer that? Well, first of all, you know you mentioned just a minute ago about the fact that uh, you, you thought maybe the linebacker was the biggest weakness on the team last year. Uh, if it wasn't linebacker, it was probably corner uh, because Joe Hayden missed five games, four because of a, of a suspension and, uh, and one uh, for injury. Uh, and uh, besides Joe Hayden, you had some other players uh, who uh, just, you know, really uh, didn't, uh, didn't hold up their end of the bargain. I think uh, you think of Sheldon Brown, the uh, who was definitely getting old, and uh, they they let him go uh, in in free agency. I'm not really too sure if Sheldon Brown has ever even signed with another team. He may be just uh, looking at uh, at retirement. Uh, but he was a solid player for us. But he just uh, he got old. Um, he, and then you have uh, Buster Screen, uh, who uh, really uh, because of uh, Joe Hayden's absence, uh, you know he's probably best suited to be a nickel back at best and uh, was really thrust into the starting lineup uh, and unfortunately because of that he made a lot of holding penalties a lot of bad pass interference penalties really frustrated Browns fans but uh, there's a lot of people that also realize that he just uh, he should have never uh, he, he should have never been put into those situations if it wasn't for Joe Hayden's uh, boneheadedness but uh, either way uh, so corner was probably their biggest weakness. Uh, you have, uh, first of all, Joe Hayden is uh, supposedly uh, has his head on straight, uh, just recently got married, uh, supposedly is settling down a little bit and focusing uh, even more on just improving his game, which, you know, let's face it, uh, he is one of the top corners in football. If he's not in the list of the top five best corners, he certainly is in the list of the top ten best. Uh, so he is uh, definitely approaching that elite status. Still has not made a Pro Bowl. Could have definitely made a Pro Bowl last year if he wouldn't have gotten suspended. Uh, so that's his goal for this year, uh, as long as uh, he can keep his head straight and stay uh, injury-free. Uh, on the other side, uh, the battle for the other starting corner is, uh, is a lot more interesting. You have uh, three names in that battle. You have Chris Owens, a free agent from the Atlanta Falcons. You have... Buster Screen, uh, who I mentioned already, and then you have uh, a, a third-round draft pick, Leon McFadden, out of, uh, I believe it's uh, San Diego State, uh, and um, so between the three of them, one of them is going to be the, the other starting corner. Uh, right now, the, the person who has the inside track uh, through the early parts of practice uh, is the free agent acquisition, Chris Owens, someone who you know, really has shined quite a bit in practice so far, and no one really talked about him when he was signed. He was just basically looked on as being like a special teams type of player. Because well, he was coming off that injury, right? That that was one of the big knocks on Owens. Well, a little bit of an injury, but um, but you know, really he played. Uh, he just uh, kind of fell out of favor with the coaches in Atlanta, and uh, he's come in here and he's been physical. He's, uh, he has uh, made plays, and he's really impressed. So uh, you have uh, Chris Owens is probably going to be the starter. Uh, for the nickelback position, you're looking at probably Buster Screen, uh, who is, uh, who's, you know, he's, he's continuing to grow. And, uh, but, I mean, you know, we picked him up in, you know, say the fourth or fifth round when we drafted him a few years ago. I mean, he never was necessarily meant to be a star. Uh, he's a small, fast guy. So, uh, but uh, but he uh, he can continue to make some uh, plays and, uh, and improve in training camp, and uh, and then the 
Leon McFadden, the third round pick, uh, really uh, has uh, has had a little bit of growing pains uh, early on. Which, you know, I mean, that's uh, he, he's not. Uh, they were hoping he could be ready to start right away. But honestly, Chris Owens has been such a pleasant surprise that they're not so worried about Leon McFadden needing a little bit more time to develop. You know, maybe even needing a whole rookie year to develop. I mean, let's face it: uh, if you're picked in the third round and you're not uh, a starter until the second year of uh, your uh, NFL career, that's that's not necessarily completely out of the question. No, and, and it, it, think back to high school or college. I mean, a lot of players get on a team, and you sit and you learn for a while. You're, you're on the second team. You play special teams. You learn. It takes you a while to learn the system. So, so what? So what if you don't come in – as soon as possible and jump into the starting role as long as you're developing and turning into a well-rounded, well-coached player that reacts instead of overthinks it out there. That's that's very important, you know, and of, and of course it's easier to do something like that when you have a team that's established with a lot of players and coaches that have been there before and you have a lot of mentors across the board, but that's just not the case with this Cleveland Browns team. It seems like every two or three years they're hitting the hard reset button and, you know, there, there's not a lot of holdover. Who is the player on the Browns that has the longest tenure with the team? Jaquel Jackson is now the elder statesman. On the offensive and defensive side, Joe Thomas has been what? What is he, seven years, eight years in? Jaquel Jackson was 2006, and Joe Thomas was 2007. Okay, all right. Winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Well, was 2008. Okay. It's just, it's just crazy. There's so many fresh faces on the team, and – can't can't say uh, can't say I, I I miss a lot of the players that have gone away because they obviously weren't getting the job done. Can't say I miss the coaches because they weren't getting the job done. Uh, so I mean, wh- you don't miss Scott Fujita. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm going to talk bad about the guy. He's a, he, that was a cool guy, and he, he does a lot of good things in the community and stuff like that. But. Uh, you know, yeah, just never could get on the field for us. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's hard to miss a lot of these guys. Um, uh, but, uh, but you know, we talked about corner. You have uh, the safeties as well. T.J. Ward is uh, certainly uh, looking uh, uh, like he's going to be, the, you know, he'll be the starter at strong safety. And, uh, you know, people uh, uh, have, I mean, really, the, he, his, his ability has never been questioned. Uh, his, uh, his problem has always been staying healthy, and so he's hoping to uh, really <clears throat> be able to play at a high level for, for uh, a full season this year. Um, the free safety spot is uh, another camp position battle. Uh, you have uh, a couple of, uh, of kind of lowly touted players. You have uh, two, uh, really, who were um, second-year un- uh, undrafted free agents in Johnson Vanamosi and, uh, and Tayshawn Gibson. Uh, Tayshawn Gibson uh, ended up starting a couple of games at the very end of the season last year uh, and uh, had the inside track uh, to start, but uh, then again, he's also been injured uh, for a few days here in training camp. Uh, they're saying that he should be back and should be fine, but... Uh, you know, as they say, never let them see your backup. And uh, so uh, he wants to get back out there as quickly as possible. So, uh, you know, the coaches aren't uh, starting to see uh, Jamal, uh, Johnson Banamosi making some plays, uh, who was a special team demon last year. And ultimately, I think that's where they'd like him to be. Uh, but uh, is learning the safety position after moving over from corner. Uh, you also have uh, Jamora Slaughter, who was a sixth-round draft pick out of Notre Dame, uh, who uh, blew out his Achilles tendon uh, this past season, uh, and uh, in like the second game or something like that. And if he wouldn't have done that, probably would have put together a season that would have put him. He was projected as a second-round draft pick, so he's coming back from that. If, uh, and he was uh, sort of uh, one of the Browns' investment picks. And so uh, as he continues to uh, rehabilitate, uh, he might be a name that you end up hearing a little bit more out of. Um, I, uh, I really think that's pretty much about it. Uh, you know, um, the defense is uh, certainly they've invested some money in it. Uh, the, between uh, the free agent acquisitions and the draft picks, I mean, their top free agent acquisitions were for, were for the defense, and their top uh, two draft picks were for – the defense as well so I mean it's certainly obvious where they uh, wanted to really invest their energies and 
and hopefully it pays off. Well, but, you know what? It mean, makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense. Number one, I'm going to miss Scott Fujita more than I miss the Charles Bentley. We can get that out of the way real quick. But yeah, I mean, you look at what the Browns did, la- uh, you know, last season. Uh, what, what did they get? They got Brandon Whedon at quarterback. They got Trent Richardson at running back. They got uh, two well uh, offensive lineman Mitchell Schwartz. They got uh, Josh Gordon. That they got their offensive aggression out last year. Give them a chance. Get a year under their belt. Come out strong this year. We're leaning on you. This year was an all defense year. I'm totally fine with going, you know, almost all d- defense after the offensive splurge that Holmgren went on trying to save his job last year. I don't, I don't regret it, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I really hope. When is our first game? What, 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 what is the next thing to look forward to? Let me, let me rephrase it. What is the next thing we need to start looking forward to as the practices start heating up here with the, the position battles? Well, the Browns uh, are going to have a family night this Saturday, uh, and uh, they'll have uh, a practice uh, at First Energy Stadium. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, free or if uh, there's a small uh, small ticket charge or something, but uh, that's going to be on Saturday. And then they play their first preseason game this Thursday uh, at home versus uh, the St. Louis Rams. And so that will be... Uh, uh, the first little taste of football, and we'll get a chance to uh, see them uh, under the lights and put some pants on and, uh, and and see what they can do here. Well, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I love this transition as we shift from basketball and we start thinking about baseball playoffs and Cleveland Browns action. So, hey, real, real quick, the Indians are riding. Let's go into overtime just for a second, and I'll let you bounce here. Any thoughts on the Tribe? Are you, are you starting to follow them any more closely now that they're really kind of hanging tight instead of dissolving in the second half like they've been uh, <laughs> so accustomed to uh, getting the fans excited and then letting them down the past few years? Any thoughts on the Tribe? Well, I've always uh, – um, I, I mean, I've uh, definitely uh, been one who has uh, still followed them uh, pretty t- closely the whole year. Um, I, I I really enjoy, you know, I, I cook a lot, uh, and I really enjoy listening to uh, the uh, you know the the Tom Hamilton uh, tele or I guess radio uh, cast of the uh, of of the Indians. I think Tom Hamilton does a great job. So uh, you know, I usually listen to at least like the first two or three innings while I'm cooking and cleaning up and stuff like that. Um, and uh, have uh, certainly been uh, much more interested in what's going on over the last uh, few weeks. They're actually already down three nothing in the nope. second inning to to Miami right now. So they're uh, you know Ubaldo Jimenez is not uh, is, was not pitching his best so far, and we all know that uh, that can get uh, out of hand in a hurry with him. Uh, but uh, but overall, definitely been uh, been pretty happy with uh, I mean what I've been seeing from the tribe lately, and uh, you know all year they've uh, certainly shown the ability to come back late in games. It's just a matter of how streaky they've been. Uh, so the the main thing is everybody in the AL Central right now from the you know with, or the top three teams, the Tigers, uh, the Indians, and the Royals are all red hot at the same exact time. Right, it's crazy. So, Nobody is gaining ground on on anyone else, and uh, you know the the tribe has to win two of three in Miami this weekend, if not all three games. And then they're going to come home and they're going to play the Tigers in a four game series. Huge. And imagine if uh, both uh, the tribe and uh, the Tigers sweep their series. Obviously, the tribe is already down three nothing, uh, but it is to Miami, so you know they can certainly come back. Um, the tribe sweeps the series with Miami. Uh, I believe, you know what? I'm, don't quote me on who the Tigers uh, are playing right now. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I think they just finished up a series with the Nationals. I'm not sure who they they're got the playing. The White that. Sox, White Sox, right now. White Sox. Okay, so imagine the Tigers sweep the White Sox. Both teams come in with uh, eight or nine, ten, eleven game winning streaks and stuff like that. How big of a uh, of a Monday night uh, walk up crowd do you think uh, the Indians are going to get? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you, so. you, it'd be it'd be really nice to see the see the community support them, and you know they're still not packing the Jake Progressive, whatever the heck it's called, but 
It is it is fun. I mean, you look at ESPN.com, the, the headline story is about the Royals still being in the AL Central race with a nine-game winning streak. Final final question in overtime here, and we'll let you bounce. Uh, any thoughts on Ohio State being the number two preseason team in all of the land? Are you getting excited for Urban Meyer's round two? Um, I mean, you know, it's pretty well uh, deserved. I mean, the team went undefeated last year against the light schedule, but uh, undefeated nonetheless, and uh, they bring back Braxton Miller, who uh, is certainly going to be a, a, a an early Heisman, uh, you know, favorite. And uh, I mean, let's face it. Uh, I mean, next to Johnny Manziel, uh, Braxton Miller might be the Heisman favorite. So. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Braxton Miller certainly seems to have his head on a lot straighter than than Manziel. But you know what? I was uh, I, I wasn't necessarily uh, an angel myself when I was uh, 19, <laughs> 20 years old. Uh, but uh, at the same time, too, I, I I made sure that I fulfilled all my commitments and and got my stuff done. And uh, there's a heck of a lot of guys that are. Uh, Johnny Manziel's uh, age in, 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 that play pro, uh, college football that are still partying their butts off, uh, you know, in in the right at the right times, you know, and uh, and and he needs to uh, he, he he needs to keep his uh, his head on straight. Uh, I certainly don't uh, don't think that that he's going to end up being a first round pick next year. Well, we'll we'll see what he's able to do. I saw Urban Meyer come out and he was talking about. Braxton have last year relying so much on his athletic talent that he's taken huge leaps and strides in, since the, the season ended, really breaking down the craft and learning what it means to be a quarterback as opposed to just being the most athletic player on the field. It's a big difference. And Urban Meyer's already talking about him being able to be – he's seeing him as an NFL quarterback, that he's made those types of adjustments. And people weren't saying that last year. They're saying, wow, the kid has potential. Now Urban Meyer's saying, hey, he, he's really put the work in in the summer. So I'm really getting excited to see it. Um, Let me just say that before, before we, we go, let me just say this. Can, you know, th- think about the fact that uh, of how – Good Ohio State's quarterback play really has been in about the last uh, seven or eight years. I mean, we've been pretty lucky to have some pretty phenomenal uh, quarterbacks, and and really it's too bad that none of them have really shown anything at the pro level. But you you think about uh, Troy Smith, obviously won the Heisman. Yeah. uh, And uh, and you think about Terrell Pryor and Braxton Miller, in a way, is making you forget about either of those guys. It's pretty crazy because that, that's been some phenomenal quarterback play. And and none of those guys even won uh, a national title like Craig Krenzel did. Go figure. <laughs> and uh, you know what? Uh, Braxton Miller might be able to uh, eclipse uh, all of them and be the best of both worlds this year. So we'll see what uh, what happens. Uh, you know, that'd be a pretty darn long winning streak to have to go on to uh, to win 28 straight or whatever. Oh, I like it. Yeah, but I like it. I like the ring of that. I don't. I don't know, Brandon. We always do our strictly brown segment. Maybe we could, maybe we could end up doing a little bit of a uh, Buckeye chatter from time to time. I'm not sure if you'd be down for that, but football is football to me. I like this time of year. It, it is a fun time of year. Well, uh, you know, there's uh, there's only so much. Uh, there, there, uh, <laughs> I am a, a a lover and a and a worker uh, and a father, and uh, uh, so sometimes uh, you can only throw in uh, football talk for so much but uh, (laughs) either way uh, you know go Browns and go Buckeyes I I certainly am looking forward to uh, to getting a chance to enjoy some uh, you know the the weekends just get infinitely more interesting oh yeah oh absolutely by the way don't forget go tribe Um, yeah absolutely man the the, the weekends I I love it you know what I'm the, the, the biggest thing that I miss being out here on the left coast is just when the leaves start turning and you can smell the coldness in the air and when when autumn actually gets there and you can see your breath and you remember what it was like going out on the football field under the lights just kind of miss that you don't really get that out here in Los Angeles but bonfires you know like uh, I know I was just talking about bonfires how much I miss them they're one of my favorite things on the planet absolutely you know and there's nothing better than than you know Sitting around by a bonfire, having some beers, and uh, you know, just uh, just enjoying 
life. Maybe coming out from a haunted house uh, and uh, you <laughs> yes. get like, some, some, some hot apple cider that they'll sell at the concession stand. That's good stuff right there. I thought you were going to talk about some hot high school girls as you're yeah, – anyway, I thought you were going a different direction. Of course, I, I mean when we were both in high school. But anyhow, I digress. Yeah, I have, I have very fond memories of being in high school and uh, – that time of year and ah, miss it man enjoy it live it up it's when it starts getting cold chilly out there it starts getting hot out here we get our summer a little later like the september's october's like we can hit triple digits it's weird but anyway go browns go buckeyes go tribe and brandon thanks again for joining us i don't know what, what do we talk about next week are we gonna do this again next week or wait till they get going well, um, it's going to be a little tough because, uh, you know, I will be in, uh, uh, in, on vacation. So. That's right. Well, do, do me a favor. Get those pictures. Get, go behind the scenes and uh, send us some cool pictures, would you? That, that'll suffice. I'll talk tribe yeah, I, next week. I, I definitely will. And, uh, and you know what? Uh, it'll, uh, it'll hopefully be, uh, be a fun uh, week to be in Cleveland with the, the, the tribe playing in Detroit at the same time. All right, pal. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll be talking again soon. Have a blast uh, touring the facility, all right? All right, that sounds great. And uh, go Browns. Go Browns. That is Brandon Odell, everybody. Good friend of mine. College roommates. We were radio co-hosts for about three and a half years at WFAL Falcon Radio. <laughs> never, never, really wor- never really worked on the radio guy voice. I think it's weird. But anyway, that's Brandon. We're talking strictly Browns. And then a little overtime because... Come on, don't forget the Buckeyes are going to be fun. The Tribe, lots of good stuff. <sighs> just, It's nice taking a break from basketball for just a minute. Just some great coverage with Zach Barris, NBA scout, that's joined us over the past two years. It's all archived. Take a look. But, man, it's, it's nice to think football and baseball playoffs again. So talking about those shows with Zach and the other shows that we've done, please do us a favor. Check out all of the places where you can find us. That would be thenewamericanmedia.com. Tons of content under politics and sports. You can find our show, Agree to Disagree, where today we're going to talk with privacy expert Catherine Albrecht, Dr. Catherine Albrecht. Coming up in a couple of minutes, you can listen to it live at thenewamericanmedia.com. Click on that little TNAM radio icon and check it out. Uh, do us a favor, subscribe to our youtube.com slash the new American media channel. We would appreciate that. Leave your comments, share the content with your friends, embed it on your YouTube uh, well, on your Facebook page, search The New American Media on Facebook, like our page, and follow us on Twitter at American underscore media underscore. So we're going to hit a hard reset, take a quick break for just a few mo- moments, moments, minutes, moments. Yes, you blend the words together, you get a strange word, minions, for just a few moments. And we're going to be back with Dr. Catherine Albrecht talking about all the ways that everyone's trying to spy into your life and sell your data and hack your stuff. And what the heck do you do about it? How do we reverse this stuff? How do we protect ourselves from creeps that are listening through our windows and looking in through, through the cracks in our doors? It's just creepy. It's, it's Orwellian. It's 1984. It's nuts. So that's why we split it up. Sports time is fun time. Now we're getting ready to dig into the, uh, the main course here. We're going to really get into some of the things that have been bugging me lately with the Edward Snowden trial and the NSA spying and and it just goes on and on. And Catherine, we, we've heard her work before. We're really interested in getting her opinion on some things. So we'll be back in just a minute. My name is Brian Engelman. This is, this has been Strictly Browns, a subdivision of the Unhappy Hour here at the TNAM Radio Network on the NewAmericanMedia.com. Appreciate your time. We'll be talking with you again in just a few. So we're gonna press pause, and you're gonna stick around. 